Christina was a vivacious child. Her father said of his four children that she and Gabriel were like two storms, while Maria and William were two calms. But Christina suffered the first in a string of bouts of ill health at the age of 15, and it's said that she became withdrawn and self-aware to the point of being neurotic. Her brother William said her temperament and character, naturally warm and free, became a fountain sealed. This period also seems to coincide with a profound deepening of her religious convictions. She was an Anglican for all of her life, and most of her poetry is devotional. I'm looking at a portrait of her now. Wistful, if melancholy, expression. Large, lidded eyes, strong nose, black hair, severely tied back. Hands clasped by her face. Seated at a desk with an open book. And that face could have been on a coin used in ancient Rome. She sat as a model many times for her brother. And for works by other pre-Raphaelites, including Millet, Hunt and James Collinson, to whom she was engaged to be married for a while. But she was never at ease socially, and actively avoided the literary scene. It's known that she did some work with fallen women from the St Mary Magdalene House of Charity in Highgate. And around the same time, and some would say this is no coincidence, that she was writing Goblin Market. At first it was simply admired as a fairy tale, but post-Freud the poem became fertile ground for revision, and much has been said about its erotic subtext. Juices sucked and smeared, syrup transmuted into gall and wormwood. Oh yes, and it's scary. I hope you will enjoy this particular rendition by Shirley Henderson, who captures the author's blending of metre and rhythmic pace to great effect. Dear listener, be prepared to be hypnotised through your ears. Are they goblin ears, perchance? Goblin Market by Christina Georgina Rossetti Morning and evening maids heard the goblins cry. Come buy our orchard fruit, come buy, come buy. Apples and quinces, lemons and oranges, plum punpeck, cherries, melons and raspberries, bloom down cheek peaches, swart headed mulberries, wild freeborn cranberries, crab apples, dewberries, pineapples, blackberries, apricots, strawberries, all ripe together in summer weather. Morns that pass by, fair eaves that fly, come by, come by. Our grapes fresh from the vine, pomegranates full and fine. Dates and sharp bullaces, rare pears and green gauges, damsons and bilberries, taste them and try. Currants and gooseberries, bright fire like barberries, fixed to fill your mouth, citrons from the south, sweet to tongue and sound to eye, come by, come by. Evening by evening, among the brookside rushes, Laura bowed her head to hear, Lizzie veiled her blushes. Crouching close together in the cooling weather with clasping arms and cautioning lips, with tingling cheeks and fingertips. Lie close, Laura said, pricking up her golden head. We must not look at goblin men, we must not buy their fruits. Who knows upon what soil they fed their hungry, thirsty roots? Come by, called the goblins, hobbling down the glen. Oh, cried Lizzie, Laura, Laura, you should not peep at goblin men. Lizzie covered up her eyes, covered close lest they should look. Laura reared her glossy head and whispered like the restless brook. Look, Lizzie, look, Lizzie. Down the glen tramp little men. One hauls a basket, one bears a plate. One lugs a golden dish of many pounds weight. How fair the vine must grow whose grapes are so luscious. How warm the wind must blow through those fruit bushes. No, said Lizzie, no, no, no. That office should not charm us, that evil gift would harm us. She thrust a dimpled finger in each ear, shut eyes and ran. Curious Laura chose to linger, wondering at each merchant ma'am. One had a cat's face, one whisked a tail, one tramped at a rat's pace, one crawled like a snail, one like a wombat, proud, obtuse and furry, one like a rattle, tumbled hurry-scurry. She heard a voice like voice of doves cooing all together. They sounded kind and full of loves in the pleasant weather. 
Laura stretched her gleaming neck like a rush embedded swan, like a lily from the beck, like a moonlit poplar branch, like a vessel at the launch when its last restraint is gone. Backwards up the mossy glen turned and trooped the goblin men with their shrill repeated cry, Come by, come by. When they reached where Laura was, they stood stock still upon the moss, leering at each other, brother with queer brother, signalling each other, brother with sly brother. One set his basket down, one reared his plate. One began to weave a crown of tendrils, leaves, and rough nuts brown. Men sell not such in any town. One heaved the golden weight of dish and fruit to offer her. Come by, come by, was still their cry. Laura stared but did not stir, longed but had no money. The whisk-tailed merchant bade her taste in tones as smooth as honey. The cat face purred, the rat face spoke a word of welcome, and the snail paced even was heard. One parrot voiced and jolly cried, Pretty goblin, still for pretty polly, one whistled like a bird. But sweet tooth Laura spoke in haste. Good folk, I have no coin to take where to Boulogne. I have no copper in my purse, I have no silver either, and all my gold is on the furs that shakes in windy weather above the rusty heather. You have much gold upon your head, they answered all together. Buy from us with a golden curl. She clipped a precious golden lock. She dropped a tear more rare than pearl, then sucked their fruit globes fair or red, sweeter than honey from the rock, stronger than man-rejoicing wine. Clearer than water flowed that juice. She never tasted such before. How should it cloy with length of use? She sucked and sucked and sucked the more fruits which that unknown orchard bore. She sucked until her lips were sore, then flung the emptied rinds away, but gathered up one kernel stone, and knew not was it night or day as she turned home alone. Lizzie met her at the gate, full of wise upbraidings. Dear, you should not stay so late. Twilight is not good for maidens. Should not loiter in the glen, in the haunts of goblin men. Do not remember Jenny? How she met them in the moonlight, took their gifts both choice and many, ate their fruits and wore their flowers, plucked from bowers where summer ripens at all hours. But ever in the moonlight she pined and pined away, sought them by night and day, found them no more but dwindled and grew grey. Then fell with the first snow, while to this day no grass will grow where she lies low. I planted daisies there a year ago that never blow. You should not loiter so. Nay, hush, said Laura. Nay, hush, my sister. I ate and ate my fill, yet my mouth waters still. Tomorrow night I will buy more, and kissed her. Have done with sorrow, I'll bring you plums tomorrow, fresh on their mother twigs, cherries worth getting. You cannot think what figs my teeth have met in what melons icy cold, piled on a dish of gold, too huge for me to hold. What? Peaches with the velvet nap, pellucid grapes without one seed, odorous indeed must be the mead whereon they grow, and pure the wave they drink, with lilies at the brink, and sugar sweet their sap. Golden head by golden head, like two pigeons in one nest, folded in each other's wings. They lay down in their curtain bed like two blossoms on one stem, like two flakes of new fallen snow, like two wands of ivory tipped with gold for awful kings. Moon and stars gazed in at them, wind sang to them lullaby. Lumbering hours forbore to fly, not a bat flapped to and fro round their rest. Cheek to cheek and breast to breast, locked together in one nest. Early in the morning, when the first cock crowed his warning, neat like bees as sweet and busy, Laura rose with Lizzie. Fetched in honey, milked the cows, aired and set to rights the hows, kneaded cakes of whitest wheat, cakes for dainty mouths to eat. Next churned butter, whipped up cream, fed their poultry, sat and sewed, talked as modest maidens should. Lizzie with an open heart, Laura in an absent dream, one content, one sick in part, one warbling for the mere bright day's delight, one longing for the night. At length slow evening came. They went with pitchers to the reedy brook, Lizzie most placid in her look, Laura most like a leaping flame. They drew the gurgling water from its deep, Lizzie plucked purple and rich golden flags, then turning homeward said, 
The sunset flushes those furthest loftiest crags. Come, daughter, not another maiden lacks. No willful squirrel wags. The beasts and birds are fast asleep. But Laura loitered still among the rushes and said the bank was steep. And said the hour was early still, the dew not fall and the wind not chill, listening ever but not catching the customary cry. Come by, come by, with its iterated jingle of sugar-baited words. Not for all her watching, once discerning, even one goblin racing, whisking, tumbling, hobbling, let alone the herbs that used to tramp along the glen in groups or single or brisk fruit merchant men, till Lizzie urged, Oh, Laura, come, I hear the fruit call, but I dare not look. You should not loiter longer at this brook. Come with me home. The stars rise, the moon bends her arc, each glow one winks her spark. Let us get home before the night grows dark, for clouds may gather, though this is summer weather. Put out the lights and drench us through, then if we lost our way, what should we do? Laura turned cold as stone to find her sister heard that cry alone, that goblin cry. Come by, our fruits, come by. Must she then buy no more such dainty fruit? Must she no more such suckers pasture find, gone deaf and blind? Her tree of life drooped from the root. She said not one word in her heart saw ache, but peering through the dimness, naught discerning, trudged home her pitcher dripping all the way. So crept to bed and lay, silent till Lizzie slept, then sat up in a passionate yearning and gnashed her teeth for balk desire and wept as if her heart would break. Day after day, night after night, Laura kept watch in vain and sullen silence of exceeding pain. She never caught again the goblin cry, Come by, come by. She never spied the goblin men hawking their fruits along the glen. But when the noon waxed bright, her hair grew thin and grey. She dwindled as the fair full moon doth turn to swift decay and burn her fire away. One day, remembering her kernel stone, she set it by a wall that faced the south, dewed it with tears, hoped for a root, watched for a waxing shoot, but there came none. It never saw the sun, it never felt the trickling moisture run. While with sunk eyes and faded mouth she dreamed of melons as a traveller sees false waves and desert drought, with shade of leaf-crowned trees and burns the thirstier in the sandful breeze. She no more swept the house, tended the fowls or cows, fetched honey, kneaded cakes of wheat, brought water from the brook, but sat down listless in the chimney nook and would not eat. Tender Lizzie could not bear to watch her sister's cankerous care, yet not to share. She night and morning caught the goblin's cry, Come by, our orchard fruits, come by, come by. Beside the brook, along the glen, she heard the tramp of goblin men. The voice and stir, poor Laura could not hear, long to buy fruit to comfort her, but feared to pay too dear. She thought of Jenny in her grave, who should have been a bride but who for joys brides hoped to have fell sick and died in her gay prime in earliest winter time with the first glazing rhyme with the first snowfall of crisp winter time till lurid winding seemed knocking at death's door then lizzie weighed no more better and worse but put a silver penny in her purse kissed laura across the heath with clumps of furs at twilight halted by the brook and for the first time in her life began to listen and look. Laughed every goblin when they spied her peeping, came towards her hobbling, flying, running, leaping, puffing and blowing, chuckling, clapping, crowing, clucking, gobbling, mopping and mowing, full of airs and graces, pulling wry faces, demure grimaces, cat-like and rat-like, rakel and wombat-like, snail-paced and hurry, parrot-voiced and whistler, helter-skelter, hurry-scurry, chattering like magpies, fluttering like pigeons, gliding like fishes. Hugged her and kissed us, squeezed and caressed us, stretched up their dishes, panniers and plates. Look at our apples, russet and dun, bob at our cherries, bite at our peaches, citrons and dates, grapes for the asking. Pears red with basking out in the sun, plums on their twigs, pluck them and suck them, pomegranates, figs. Good folk, said Lizzie, mindful of Jenny. Give me much and many, held out her apron, tossed them her penny. 
Nay, take a seat with us, honor and eat with us, they answered, grinning. Our feast is but beginning, night yet is early, warm and dew pearly, wakeful and starry. Such fruits as these no man can carry. Half their bloom would fly, half their dew would dry, half their flavor would pass by. Sit down and feast with us, be welcome guest with us, cheer you and rest with us. Thank you, said Lizzie. But one waits at home alone for me, so without further parleying, if you will not sell me any of your fruits, though much and many, give me back my silver penny I toss to you for a fee. They began to scratch their pate, no longer wagging, purring, but visibly demurring, grunting and snarling. One called her proud, cross-grained, uncivil, their tones waxed loud, their looks were evil. Lashing their tails, they trod and hustled her, elbowed and jostled her, clawed with her nails, barking, mewing, hissing, mocking, tore her gown and soiled her stocking, twitched her hair up by the roots, stamped upon her tender feet, held her hands and squeezed their fruits against her mouth to make her eat. White and golden Lizzie stood, like a lily in a flood, like a rock of blue vein stone lashed by tides obstreperously, like a beacon left alone in a hoary roaring sea, sending up a golden fire, like a fruit crowned orange tree, white with blossoms, honey sweet, all set by wasp and bee, like a royal virgin town topped with gilded dome and spire, close beleaguered by a fleet, mad to tug her standard down. One may lead a horse to water, twenty cannot make him drink. Though the goblins cuffed and caught her, coaxed and fought her, bullied and besought her, scratched her, pinched her black as ink, kicked and knocked her, mauled and mocked her. Lizzie uttered not a word, would not open lip from lip lest they should cram a mouthful in, but laughed in heart to feel the drip of juice that syruped all her face and lodged in dimples of her chin and streaked her neck which quaked like curd. At last the evil people, worn out by her resistance, flung back her penny, kicked their fruit along whichever road they took, not leaving root or stone or shoot. Some writhed into the ground, some dived into the brook with a ring and a ripple, some scudded on the gale without a sound, some vanished in the distance. In a smart ache, tingle, Lizzie went her way, knew not was it night or day, sprang up the back door through the furs, threaded cops and dingle, and heard her penny jingle pouncing in her purse, its bounce was music to her ear. She ran and ran, as if she feared some goblin man docked her with jibe or curse or something worse. But not one goblin scurried after, nor was she pricked by fear. The kind heart made her windy pace that urged her home quite out of breath with haste and inward laughter. She cried, Laura, up the garden, did you miss me? Come and kiss me. Never mind my bruises. Hug me, kiss me, suck my juices, squeeze from goblin fruits for you. Goblin pulp and goblin dew, eat me, drink me, love me, Laura, make much of me. For your sake I have braved the glen and had to do with goblin merchant men. Laura started from her chair, flung her arms up in the air, clutched her hair. Lizzie, Lizzie, have you tasted for my sake the fruit forbidden? Must your light like mine be hidden? Your young life like mine be wasted? Undone in mine undoing and ruined in my ruin, thirsty, cankered, goblin-ridden. She clung about her sister, kissed and kissed and kissed her. Tears once again refreshed her shrunken eyes, dropping like rain after long, sultry drought, shaking with aquish fear and pain. She kissed and kissed her with the hungry mouth. Her lips began to scorch. That juice was wormwood to her tongue. She loathed the feast, writhing as one possessed. She leapt and sung, rent all her robe and wrung her hands in lamentable haste and beat her breast. Her locks streamed like the torch borne by a racer at full speed or like the mane of horses in their flight or like an eagle when she stems a light straight toward the sun or like a caged thing freed or like a flying flag when armies run.
Swift fire spread through her veins, knocked at her heart, met the fire smouldering there and overbore its lesser flame. She gorged on bitterness without a name. Ah, oh, fool to choose such part of soul-consuming care. Sense failed in the mortal strife, like the watchtower of a town which an earthquake shatters down, like a lightning-stricken mast, like a wind-uprooted tree sp- Spun about, like a foam top water spout cast down headlong in the sea, she fell at last. Pleasure passed and anguish passed. Is it death? Or is it life? Life out of death. <laughs> That night long, Lizzie watched by her, counted her pulses, flagging stir, felt for her breath, held water to her lips and cooled her face with tears and fanning leaves. But when the first birds chirped about their eaves and early reapers plodded to the place of golden sheaves, and dew wet grass bowed in the morning wind so brisk to pass, a new buds with new day opened of cup-like lilies on the stream. Laura awoke as from a dream, laughed in the innocent old way, hugged Lizzie, but not twice or thrice. Her gleaming lock showed not one thread of grey. Her breath was sweet as May, and light danced in her eyes. Days, weeks, months, years afterwards when both were wives with children of their own, their mother hearts beset with fears, their lives bound up in tender lives. Laura would call the little ones and tell them of her early prime, those pleasant days long gone of not returning time, would talk about the haunted glen, the wicked, quaint fruit merchant men, their fruits like honey to the throat. But poison in the blood, men sell not such in any town. Would tell them how her sister stood in deadly peril to do her good and win the fiery antidote. Then joining hands to little hands, would bid them cling together. For there is no friend like a sister in calm or stormy weather, to cheer one on the tedious way, to fetch one if one goes astray. To lift one if one totters down, to strengthen whilst one stands. Goblin Market by Christina Rossetti, read by Shirley Henderson.